Good evening. I am filling in for the man who regularly works this shift, and uh, it is my assignment now to interview one of the most influential of today's young musicians, a man equally at home in the fields of pure jazz, rock and roll, folk rock, rock folk, rock folk, and whatever. Here is Sonny Cool. That's right, man. Here I is. Yes. Mr. Cool, you are currently appearing in town with the Sonny Cool Sextet. Uh, tell me, who are the members of your sextet? Well, uh, there's like me, mm -hmm. and my drummer Crash Diet, mm -hmm. and uh, my flautist Mohammed Jones. Well, that's only three people. How about the other four that make up the sextet? Yeah, how about them? They're too much. Actually, they rarely show up. But it's cool, because uh, when we get to their choruses, like, uh, we just lay out and think about what they would play if they were on the scene. You dig? I'm not sure. Uh, tell me, uh, what is your instrument, Mr. Cool? Well, I play the ivories. I see. You play the piano. No, man, not the piano. The ivories. It's a, a bunch of elephant tusks laced together. I see. I doubt it. It makes a groovier sound, but uh, while you're playing, you got to keep an eye on the trunk every inch of the way, man, because it can reach right out and grab you by the clavement, you know. Oh. How did you happen to form your sextet, Mr. Cool? Well, uh, like I took these young cats and I welded them into a real fine group, you know. I welded them into a boss outfit. Uh -huh. You see yourself then as a band leader? No, uh, as a welder. I see. What are your hobbies, Sonny? Well, man, uh, like I dig sports cars. In fact, uh, I'm now driving a crazy set of wheels. Really too much. It's got full pipes, six carburetors, twin gaskets, and it does a groovy 125 in second. And now I'm saving up some bread to get some extra equipment for it, something I've always wanted. And what's that? A steering wheel. <coughs> what's the matter, man? <coughs> I, I think I need a little... A drink to, uh, as we say, to wet my whistle. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, what's that uh, shiny little thing you took out of your pocket that you're uh, drinking out of, man? Uh, that's a hip flask. It don't look so hip to me. Uh, yes, never mind. Listen now, you mentioned your uh, flautist. Uh, I'm not familiar with that word. What does a flautist play? He plays the flout, man. You putting me on? Well, yes, I, I put you on here about uh, two minutes ago, and we've both been on since then. Crazy. What are you on? I'm on the air. Oh, groovy. I'll have to try that. Some sort of zen or yogi scene, I suppose, huh? I'm afraid, sir, that I don't follow you. I'd be afraid if you did, man. Uh, well, tell me, where are you playing in town? At what club? Well, last week, we played at the Banana Boat, mm -hmm. and now we're at a place called something else. And what else is it called? What else is what called? The place you're playing. I just told you, it's something else. Never mind. Uh, what uh, songs, Mr. Cool? What songs are you recording at present? Well, uh, like I just did an album called Sonny with Strings. Oh, you use violins. No, man. Strings. You know, like twine, thread, skinny rope. I see. Yeah, you can get groovy sounds out of them little things if you pluck them just right, you dig? Mm -hmm. But I recorded some nice old tunes, some, uh, some mood things. I see. Such as? Such as Stokely Carmichael's Stardust. I see. Uh, Mr. Cool, you have a lot of young fans who, uh, if you don't mind my saying so, wear strange clothes and uh, seem to live by their own rules. What do you think of boys with hair longer than their girlfriends? With hair longer than their girlfriends what? I don't know. I don't know. I must say, I, I'm not the regular man here, you understand. I'm just filling in. I'm, I dig, I dig. Yeah, I must say that I, uh, I don't seem to be doing a very good job of uncovering the real inner Sonny Cool. I wonder what makes you tick. Oh, I don't know, man. Unless it's this uh, cheap wristwatch I'm wearing. But don't worry, Pops. After all, we just met. Well, not really. Uh, oddly enough, you see, you literally bumped into me at the airport here in town about six weeks ago. Oh, excuse me, man. Uh, sorry I took so long to apologize. Well, it's, it's nothing. Uh, now, Mr. Cool, you, uh, you're also a composer of music. Just how do you write your songs? Oh, brilliantly, man. Brilliantly. That's not quite what I... Well, never mind. One last question. What would you advise young people who want to follow in your footsteps? 
Well, if they find anything I drop, I hope they'll bring it to me before the fuzz finds it. Uh, but seriously, I think young cats who want to make the scene should form a group and get a good name for themselves. How do you mean, get a good name? Well, you know, like the Electric Prunes, the Chocolate Watch Band, the Jefferson Airplane, mm -hmm. the Only Alternative and his other possibilities. In oh. fact, I invented a name machine that can make up names all by itself. A name machine? How does it work? Well, it's got two sections, man. One section is full of adjectives like chocolate, electric, yellow, velvet, sideways, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then the other section is full of nouns. Nouns. Like watch band, applesauce, sweatshirt, hockey puck. You dig? I think so, yes. Now, you just take a word from column A uh -huh. and a word from column B. Mm -hmm. And you automatically got the name of a new group. Now, look here. Let's shake up the box. That's it. Now, we got... The chocolate catcher's mitt. Oh, yes. The electric bird seed. I see. Let me shake that thing up there. Oh, look what I've got. The velvet garbage can. And the peanut butter brassiere. Oh, yes. And it fell into place all by itself. <laughs> it's not our fault. Let's see here. The... Oh, look at that. The oatmeal typewriter. <laughs> and here's the molasses draft card. Yes. Let's see what these two words. The Presbyterian sunflower. And... The psychedelic postage stamp. Yes, the chocolate dress shield. This is remarkable how this thing works. The unmitigated cream. All right, flower children. Old Jasbo here with another grim fairy tale for hip kids. This time, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Once upon a time, long, long ago, at the intersection of Simon and Garfunkel, there lived a little girl named Goldilocks. One day, Goldilocks' mother said, Honey, you can sit the next set out in the backyard if you promise not to goof off and get lost. mommy -o said Goldie, heading for the yard. This is the place. Crazy, said her mother, returning to her household chores. And for a while, Goldilocks was content to play in the backyard, but... Finally, she became bored and decided to see a bit of the world. She wandered out through the back gate and soon found herself in a deep, dark forest. In no time, she was hopelessly lost, and her terror mounted as she perceived that it was getting quite dark. Suddenly, in the distance, she saw a light flickering in the darkness, and with hopes high, she ran toward it. The light, she soon observed, came from a strange little house in the middle of the forest, a house she had never seen before. Fearfully, she knocked on the door. Hearing no answer, she entered. And inside the house, she saw three chairs. How about that, said Goldie. The Supremes must be working this spot. She next spied three steaming bowls of soup on a table. Hey, this joint must have been busted, she said. It looks like everybody split. Sampling the soup, she learned that the largest bowl was very hot. The next bowl was very cool, and the little bowl was just right. Well, naturally, she chose the cool bowl. Then, feeling a bit weary, she walked upstairs where she found a bedroom with three beds in it. These dressing rooms on the road, Goldie said to herself, are the lowest. Then, drowsy, she lay down on the smallest bed and fell asleep. Shortly thereafter, the downstairs door banged open and in walked three bears. I smell our page, said the mama bear to her mate. Gus, you've had a broad here. You're out of your skull, said the papa bear good-naturedly. Although it does look as if somebody had eyes for the soup over there. I'm hip, said the mama bear, and dig. The upstairs bedroom door is ajar. No, it's a door, said the baby bear. Smokey, said the papa bear, you've been exposed to too much television comedy. Shall we fall upstairs and find out what's happening, said the mama bear. That open door is like Weirdsville. Après vous, said the papa bear, that's French for I'm chicken. But at last he led the way upstairs and into the bedroom where Goldilocks lay asleep. Wow, said the papa bear, somebody's been making it in my bed. Hey, there's been a scuffle in my pad, too, said the mama bear. 
I don't like to start idle gossip, said the baby bear, but uh, if you'll take it from me, you'll dig that there's a chick in my sack right now, live and in full color. So there is, said the papa bear, shaking Goldilocks gently. Baby, wake up, he said. You'd better check with the desk clerk. Goldilocks rolled over and mumbled sleepily, Oh, Jack, don't bug me. I'm beat. Well, be that as it may, said the papa bear. You'll have to make the lion scene someplace else. Oh, I'm sorry, said Goldilocks, perceiving her error at last. Forgive me for coming on so square. Like, uh, no problem, said the bear, showing her downstairs. And so the three bears pointed out to Goldilocks the way back to her home, after which she never again disobeyed her mother. But sometimes, though, in the spring, she leaps through the latest cash box to see where the trios are playing. I don't know if you cats caught the news item out of Norwalk, Connecticut the other day, but I'd like to read it to you. Jazz resounded through the vaults of St. Paul's Church today, celebrating the 20th century mass with the aid of a four-man jazz combo. The Reverend Anthony P. Treasure, rector, called the service, very reverent, very impressive, very moving. In his sermon, Father Treasure made no direct allusion to his innovation but spoke on the theme, God is not only or primarily interested in religion, a quotation from an unnamed Dean of Canterbury. Saturday night we went to confession, and Sunday night we had a crazy session, when the Reverend Anthony P. Treasure, with a steady four beats to the measure, said, welcome to our Sunday school and I'm sure you'll find it very cool. To tell the truth, I dug his sermon. The man came on like Woody Herman, and Dad, it was a real gas when the choir sang How High the Mass. You could tell he was a swinging gate, the way he passed the collection plate, but the brethren almost blew their tops when the acolytes called the Reverend Pops. Instead of Ite Missa Est, he feels that Go Man Go is best. While Paul's epistle to the Jews, he reads to the St. Louis Blues, played by a wailing alto sax, so hip the ushers flip their stacks. The group so wild, they ought to disc them. Who said, fats domino vobiscum? Now, I don't want to drag the scene, but let me lay down what I mean. One goes to church to save one's soul, not to rock and not to roll. And man, I doubt if good St. Paul would really dig this kind of ball. Perhaps I may be somewhat square when it comes to progressive prayer, but I suspect the Holy Ghost would not consider it the most. And though the congregation cool it, a bishop still might overrule it. Or else someday, when our souls fly to that big bird land in the sky, we might hear Prez or Bird or Jerry in an unnamed Dean of Canterbury tell Gabriel to lose his horn, get lost with his old-fashioned corn. Imagination falters, faints when it considers swinging saints led by Louis, Roy, or Bix, heard from the Jordan to the sticks. So let's not sell the organ yet, despite the groovy press we get. You have your horns, and though you blow them, still by their fruits to said you'll know them. So cool it for the moment, Gate, or we might see this tragic fate. Mass in the vernacular, a Timex jazz spectacular. That's right, kiddies. This is the story of the three little pigs based on the original story from way back. Once upon a time in the land of Nitty Gritty, there lived three little pigs. One of the little pigs was very cool. Another was more on the commercial side, 
and the third was, beyond the shadow of a doubt, as square as they come. In fact, he was almost octagonal. One day, as the three little pigs were taking five, one of them chanced to pick up a copy of Downbeat. Hey, fellas, he said, I see here where the big bad wolf is playing a one-nighter in this area next week. Uh-oh, said the second little pig. That means it's panic time. This, said the square little pig, is the most depressing news since Ronnie Reagan got out of show business. Right, said the hip little pig, we'd better scuffle. Well, since the approach of the big bad wolf indeed signaled danger, the three little pigs immediately set about the business of constructing suitable shelter. The square little pig arranged the quick GI loan and in no time erected a sturdy Orange County modern bungalow complete with wall-to-wall -wall floors and a TV antenna. The commercial little pig moved into a foreclosed condominium and at the last possible moment, the cool little pig built himself a small A-frame temple out of clarinet reeds and scotch tape. Well, children, the big bad wolf eventually arrived in town. And the first place he went was to the home of the third little pig. Applying his hairy knuckles to the door, he laid down a crisp paradiddle and said, Man, it's a raid. Pops, whispered the pig from behind the locked door, it's after closing. Don't hand me that jazz, said the wolf impatiently. Open up. Sorry, Irv, said the pig. You got to make reservations. Besides, you shouldn't even be out this late. Ain't you hip to the curfew? The what, said the wolf? Curfew, said the pig. Gesundheit, said the wolf, hoping to pass as a television comedian. Funny, said the pig. I'll see you next week, same time, same channel. Charlie, said the wolf, with ill-concealed displeasure. If you don't open that door, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Tell me one thing, said the little pig. What condition is your lip in? Enraged at this impertinence, the wolf came on like Joshua, the walls came tumbling down, and in no time at all, the poor little pig was really gone. The following day, the big bad wolf traveled across town and knocked at the door of the second little pig. Who dat, said the pig, trying to sound hip. Never mind, snapped the wolf, anxious for destiny to resume its inexorable march. Open that door and give me some skin, pig. Or give me some pig skin, as the case may be. I'll handle the joke, said the pig. Did you have an appointment? Don't bug me, buster, said the wolf. When I'm in town, I always stop at the pork club. Now open up. No, man, said the pig. In fact, not by the hair on my chinny-chin-chin. Well, what do you know about that, said the wolf. That must be Sam the Sham in there. Oh, never mind the whisker joke, said the pig. I ain't gonna open up. I'll tell you what, baby, said the wolf with wily warmth. I'll just peek through your keyhole. In a pig's eye, you will, said the little pig, which angered the wolf so terribly that he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house down. In a very short time, the second little pig met the fate that had befallen his unlucky friend. The next day, the big bad wolf went to the home of the cool little pig and knocked on the door. Have no fear, he said. Murray the K is here. Look, I don't care if it's Paul Krasner, said the little pig. Hang tough. Now, wait a minute, said the wolf, pretending not to have heard the rebuff. I understand there's a session going on here today. Cut out, Whitey, said the pig. We're not televising the hearings. But I heard I could get my kicks here, said the wolf. I'd like to sit in. I'm hip, said the little pig. And if you'll just slide down the chimney as per instructions in the script, I'll really give you something to sit in. You're not putting me on, are you, said the wolf? Well, uh, yes and no, said the pig. Oh, man, the wolf said, sniffing at a wisp of smoke. You wouldn't be uh, lighting up in there, would you? See for yourself, Pop, said the pig. Losing his patience at last, the wolf hitched up his mod strides, leaped to the roof, and in so doing, dislodged a brick which fell down the chimney and clanged loudly against the great iron pot in the fireplace. What was that? the wolf shouted. E flat, said the pig. Daddy, fall in. And fall in, the wolf did. Down the chimney and right into the pot. 
Nimbly, the little pig clapped a cover on the top, and the wolf was trapped. Let me out, he howled, but the pig was merciless. Burn, baby, burn, he replied. After allowing the water to simmer for 48 hours over a low flame, the little pig lifted the cover, peered down into the pot, sniffing tentatively. Ah, ah, he said with a broad smile, my favorite soup, cream of nowhere. The gentle power of a flower can crack a mighty stone. This is the hour of the power of pure love alone. Girls and boys now share their joys now in the summer sun. Happy weather, friends together, till we all are one. The Golden Gate is wide and straight, welcoming the throng. From the steeple, Chimes call people all to sing this song. Rest from labor, love thy neighbor. Practice what you preach. June, July time, now it's high time all along the beach. Sun or shower, wear a flower, rose or daffodil. If we show them, all will know them till the night is still. The gentle power of a flower can crack a mighty stone. This is the hour of the power of pure love alone. there, kiddies. This is your Uncle Jasbo once again with another bedtime story. This time, the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Once upon a time, many years ago, in the land of Nod, there lived a lovely little girl named Red Riding Hood. One day, Red Riding Hood's mother called her into the kitchen and said, Honey, I just got word that your grandma is feeling the least. Oh, what a drag, said Little Red. What's the bit? Hangoversville, for all I know, said her mother. Anyway, I fixed up a real wild basket of ribs and collard greens, and I'd like you to fall by Grandma's joint this afternoon and lay the stuff on her. Crazy, said Red, and uh, say, while you're at it, why not add a bottle of juice? You know, Granny, would appreciate some sauce, I think. Okay, said her mother. Picking up the basket, Little Red headed for her grandmother's cottage, going by way of the deep woods. And they were very deep. Little did she know that a big bad wolf lurked in the heart of the forest. Yeah, she traveled but a short distance, when the wolf leaped out from behind a bush and confronted her. Oh, said Red politely, you startled me. I thought you were Viet Cong. I'm on your side, said the wolf. Say, you wouldn't be Little Red Riding Hood, would you? I ain't Eleanor Rigby, said Red, tugging modestly at her hip huggers. Well, baby, said the wolf, give me some skin. Sorry, Pop, said Red, some other time. Right now, I have to make it over to my grandmother's place. Square time, said the wolf. Why don't you blow your grandmother and we'll have some laughs. Man, said Red, we've had it. Out of my way, I gotta take a trip. Wild, said the wolf, like, uh, let's make it a twosome. No dice, said Red. Boom and zip. Well, have it your way, said the wolf. Later, baby. And so saying, the wolf bounded off through the forest and was soon lost to sight. But his evil mind was at work. Unbeknownst to Red Riding Hood, he took a shortcut through the trees and in a few minutes stood panting before the helpless old grandmother's cottage. Quietly, he knocked at the door. That's a familiar beat, said Red Riding Hood's grandmother. Who's out there? 
Western Union, lied the wolf. I have a special invitation to Sunday and Cher's opening at the bowl. Boss, cried the grandmother, happily hobbling across the room. Imagine her horror when, upon opening the door, she perceived the wolf. In an instant, he'd leaped into the house, gobbled her up, and disguised himself in her nightclothes. Hearing Red Riding Hood's footsteps on the stones of the garden path, he leaped into the poor old lady's bed, pulled the covers up over his chin, and smiled toward the door in a grandmotherly way. When Little Red Riding Hood knocked, he said, Hit me again! Who goes? It's me, Graham, said Red Riding Hood. Mother heard you were feeling pretty beat. She thought you might want to pick up on some ribs and collard greens. Nutty, said the wolf, fall in. Red Riding Hood opened the door, stepped inside, and looked around the room. Wowie, she said. Graham, it looks like there was a happening here last night. Oh, sorry I didn't have time to straighten up the pad before you got here, said the wolf, but uh, you know how it is. Um, what did you say was in the basket? Oh, the same old jazz, said Red. Baby, said the wolf, don't put it down. I have to, said Red, it's getting heavy. I didn't come here to play straight, said the wolf, let's open the basket. I got eyes. I'm hip, said Red. Grandma, what groovy eyes you have. The better to dig you with, my dear, said the wolf. But Grandma Red said, I don't want to sound rude, but what a long nose you have. Yeah, said the wolf, it is a gasser. And Grandma said, Red, your ears are the most, to say the least. The better to bug your phone with, my dear, said the wolf, ivishly. And Grandma said, Red, on the TV they advertise stuff that'll banish unsightly facial hair. Say, what is this, snapped the wolf. Face inspection? I mean, I know I don't look the greatest, but what are you going to do? Let's just say I'm not photogenic. You know something, Little Red Riding Hood said, squinting suspiciously at the furry head on the pillow. I don't want to sound like the fuzz or anything, but uh, you don't look like my grandmother at all. You look like uh, some cat I've seen before. Baby, said the wolf, you're freaking out. No, man, insisted Red, I just dug your nose again and it's too much. I don't want to come right out and ask to see your ID, you understand, but where's my grandmother? The wolf stared at Red Riding Hood for a long, terrible moment. Your grandmother, he said, is gone. Ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, said Red. She swinged like a pendulum do. But where is she? She split, said the wolf. Don't hand me that jazz, said Red, whereupon the wolf, being at the end of his patience, leaped out of bed and began to chase poor Red Riding Hood about the room. Little did he know that the wolf season had opened that very day and that a passing hunter could hear Little Red Riding Hood's frantic cry for help. Rushing into the cottage, the brave hunter dispatched the wolf with one bullet. Man, said Red gratefully, your timing was like the end, you know. And so it was. Well, now, this has got to be one of my favorite stories, Jack and the Beanstalk, or the case of the 3D Broccoli. Once upon a time, there lived a boy named Jack who was very poor. He and his mother lived in a small, run-down house by the side of the road, if you call that living. One day, Jack and his mother decided to take inventory of their holdings. One cow, said Jack, starting at the top of the page. Don't look now, boy, said his mother. But we just finished. We're busted. We gotta get a new bag. So here's the lick. Take this beat up bovine to market and don't come back without some real bread. I dig, said Jack, and off he went. As he strolled along the Sunset Strip, he chanced to meet a stranger with secret agent glasses and a mod cap. Hey man, said the stranger, where you going with that cow? 
I'm going to turn her in for a year's supply of money, Jack said. The cost of living's gone up to five eighty a quart. But uh, say, don't I remember you from Berkeley? Yeah, man, said the stranger. I couldn't make the tuition scene, so I bugged out. But I can see that when it comes to cows, you don't know a hill of beans. I'll make you an offer here and now. What's your offer, said Jack. A hill of beans, said the stranger, but dig, these are magic beans. Anything like mushrooms, Jack said, ever a free thinker? No, man, the stranger said, you don't smoke these, you plant them. Are they jumping beans, Jack asked. Yes, said the stranger, they're the jumpinest. Well, lay them on me, Jack said, and surrendering his cow, he headed toward home with a handful of beans. When he told his mother what had transpired, she was furious. You know what I like about you, she said, is that you got an open mind. You got holes in your head. It was with a heavy heart and a lumpy skull that Jack retired that night, having thrown his beans out into the garden. Well, imagine his surprise when upon awakening in the morning, he saw growing in the backyard a green beanstalk that towered high up into the sky. Mama, he shouted, look, it came from outer space. Well, rip my miniskirt, his mother said. Boy, you were born stupid and you've been losing ground ever since. This 3D broccoli is headed the other way. Now shinny up it like quick. See what they're advertising on top. We may be able to rent out the space. At that, Jack began to climb the beanstalk. He climbed for hours and hours until he found himself at last in the clouds and, even more surprising, at the gates of an enormous castle. Curious, he entered the castle, and there, asleep at the table, he discovered a giant. Well, burn my draft card, Jack said, if this isn't the jolly green giant. At the sound of Jack's voice, the giant stirred and awoke. Would you be so jolly if you were a giant? The giant asked. And green to boot? And anyway, fee fi fo fum Yeah, do the monkey. Yeah, 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 Jack sang, trying to find the key. fee fi fo fum the giant repeated with a terrible scowl, pounding on the table. Muff off eef eef, said Jack, doing the pony. What's that, asked the giant. That's fee fi fo fum spelled backwards, said Jack. Look, I know you tall cats like to get high, but this up here is ridiculous. Where are we? A man's home is his castle, the giant roared. Don't bug me with the Rumford Act, Jack said, trying to appear in control. I asked you a civil question. What part of town are we in? I tell you, this is my castle, cried the giant. Thank you, Timothy Leary, said Jack. And when you're ready to come in for a landing, wire me. At that moment, a large plump goose hopped up onto the table. How's your bird, said Jack. Fine, man, said the giant. This is the goose that lays the golden eggs. Well, said Jack, the price of everything is up these days. You don't dig me, said the giant. I tell you, this goose actually pays off a full jackpot every 20 minutes. Greeny, said Jack, I hope you'll let me play a tape of this conversation back to you after you rejoin the earth people. I mean, you're so far out, you're in. But at that moment, as luck would have it, the goose laid a big golden egg before Jack's very eyes. Oh, I take it all back, man, Jack said. El Gusarino is Fort Knox with feathers after all. Look, I didn't bring my library card, but I think I'll take this item home for a few days. So saying, he boldly grabbed the goose and ran lickety-split for the castle gate with the giant in angry pursuit. In a moment, Jack was sliding down the beanstalk lickety-split. When he reached the ground, he grabbed an axe and began chopping furiously at the base of the stalk. I would have gotten down sooner, Mom, he explained, but my lickety split. Never mind that, his mother said, but how will I ever get these chlorophyll stains off your inseam? Wisely, Jack kept chopping. In a matter of seconds, the beanstalk toppled over into a nearby used car lot and the giant crashed into both seats of a 52 Chevy convertible like an outtake of a Hertz commercial. In the days and weeks that followed, the goose laid up a storm. One yellow submarine after another tumbled into her nest. Jack ran out, 
bought himself 27 turtleneck sweaters, a new pair of motorcycle boots, signed up for a course with Bob Dylan's diction teacher, and even began to let the word drop that he might run for governor. Unfortunately, he spent his new riches so carelessly that when eternal revenue time came around, he barely had enough left to pay his taxes. He had only enough money left, in fact, to buy himself an old cow. The moral of this story, children, is no matter what the outcome, if you have a cow that won't give milk, sell him. Uh, folks, this is Al Collins, and uh, I hope you've been enjoying some of the sounds that you've heard on this album. And if you'll take a look at the uh, reverse side of the cover, which is known as the liner notes, you will see certain credentials there that uh, could be filled out and returned to you a Bandito sticker for your windshield, for your automobile, your boat, your motorcycle, pogo stick, or whatever means of locomotion you have. But to be in the Banditos is indeed a proud thing, because... We steal from the poor and give it to the rich because they know how to spend it. And the banditos really get something for nothing. And as El Jefe de los Bandidos, which means the leader of the group, all you need is a burro, a machete, and be able to ride and meet with us at any midnight that we state. We'll send you all the particulars, and all you have to do to get in is raise your left hands. Now, will you please all raise your left hands, and we will swear you in in both Spanish and English. First, we'll do it in Spanish. No tengo, no tengo que, enseñarle que enseñarle ningunas, ningunas chapas, chapas malditas. malditas. Now we'll do it all together. No tengo que enseñarle no tengo que enseñarle Ningunas chapas malditas Ningunas chapas malditas Now we do it in English. That was very good. We're Keep your left hand up, please. <laughs> I don't got to show you I don't got to show you No stinking badges No stinking badges that's it. And you're all in and members of the group. All you've got to do is fill out the certificate, send it in, and we will take you into the bandito.